Because as I went to Uganda and was teaching in this context where my students were 100%, all of them were ESL, some of them had learned English maybe that year, and I was supposed to teach them Homer and Virgil and Shakespeare. And I mean, technically I did, I guess. I sat in on the class. But we'll get to that. Um, and this was a context where Uganda is one of the most impoverished countries in the world. Walking down the street every day, you see poverty all around you. So the education system was built around jobs. Everything was about the practical side of learning. Where is this going to get me? And then also I taught in an international school setting where it was the same thing, except now it was the opposite extreme. So I was teaching the children of the diplomats and they were in Uganda for a short period of time and they'd come in all powerful and say, you have to teach my child something they can do something with. And I'd be like, great, here's Shakespeare. <laughs> so I had to find a way to justify this to myself on these two polar ends where I knew my children needed a job. I knew they needed food. And I had to reconcile the fact that I wasn't teaching them something that was a trade that they could go out and do and earn money from soon so that they could live to read the next book. But then I also had to, on the other end, justify giving stories to children who were expected to be the next politicians in the world. So I had to really sit down with myself and say, okay, why am I doing this? What is the value in these stories? So I was teaching, like I mentioned, I was homeschooling a family that had many adopted Ugandan children. So they brought me over to Uganda. Initially, I was there just to homeschool them through high school to get them ready for an American university. So that's where I was dealing with primarily the Ugandan students in that context, which was also, as you could probably guess, Teaching Ugandan students meant teaching traumatized students. So there's always layers of trauma that were involved. And then, I, and then I moved on to an international school, as I mentioned, and that was a whole different set of problems. And then after that, or kind of in, in line with that, I started fostering a little child who at the time we thought was three years old. No one, she didn't have a birth certificate. No one actually knew. We just guessed based on her size and abilities. Turns out she was actually four, um, but she wasn't speaking almost at all. She spoke a few words in Luganda, which was the regional language, but she didn't speak any English when she came to live with me. So there was a huge language barrier. So in all of these three contexts, with my own foster child, and then also in the international school and in the Ugandan homeschooling context, I was using story. I was teaching literature, and poetry, and sometimes math and science, but mostly it was literature, poetry, history. We spent a lot of time in ancient Greece. And I had to find a way to, to um, justify that to both myself and to the parents. So I wanna take you tonight through the things that I learned in this experience, the stories that I found most valuable as I was teaching these students. Um, and, and a little bit about my journey as well as the thoughts I was thinking as I was rationalizing teaching story. Okay. So as I was thinking about, well, is it good to teach story? What is the value of teaching stories? Should we be more practical? The first thing I had to do was sit down and very intentionally define story. What is a story? So this is my definition, and I hope that I'll be able to prove this to you tonight. A story is the embodiment of universal patterns and consequent expression of transcendent truths. So it's not to be confused with propaganda. Most of the time when we think about stories, we actually are talking about propaganda, because if we elevate the content of something over the form, if it's all about the message, if it's all about here, learn this moral, that's not what I'm talking about, that's not a story. That's propaganda. A story is something that takes abstract, universal, objectively true, always true things that are in the universe, breathes them through human experience, plants them within the physical realm of humanity, and then allows 
the story to grow like a flower from that soil. That's story. Anything else just isn't true story. So you can think of this like constellations, and I think this works very well because humans have imagined story in the stars. So we, ha we have the stars in the sky, and in, in the ancient world they imagined, and I think in a lot of ways we still do, that the sky is representative of transcendent realities. And the, the human experiences are written in the stars. So they look up at the stars and in them, they see evidence that there is a structured order within the cosmos. So every single night when they go outside and they look up at the stars, they see patterns. And they see that they're always there, they don't change. And this means that they could start to write their stories in the patterns, and the patterns wrote their stories. It worked both ways, I think. So, so there was this confidence that the world isn't simply chaos, that there is actual order in the world. So stories give us a perspective of reality as it truly is, and these abstract realities are able to be embodied in patterns. You can also think of stories like a tapestry, so on one side of the tapestry, we see the patterns, we see the images, and then if you look on the other side, it looks like chaos. Most of us, most of human experience, is living on the other side of the tapestry, the side that looks like chaos. But stories allow us to walk to the other side and to see that there's structure and order and pattern in the universe and that things aren't all random, and that there is an objective reality. So that's what the stories throughout history, the stories of humans throughout history, have proclaimed. Now this was essentially, this was very, very important in my experience in Uganda because I was dealing with traumatized students. And we know that one of the causes of trauma, or one of the um, impacts of trauma, is feeling that reality has shattered and that there's no order in the world, that all is chaos, and then losing yourself in that chaos. So the greatest thing I could do to start healing the way that my students had seen reality as this broken reality was to give them patterns to live in. And if they had robust enough patterns, then when they faced chaos, they could believe in those patterns, those patterns could carry them through the chaos, and they could make something new out of that chaos and rebuild it within the patterns. So I, need, I knew that the patterns in story were important for healing their trauma. And then also because I had students from, I haven't actually counted, but I would guess over 40 different countries in one classroom. At one point I was teaching 86 students and at any given moment I never knew what language I was gonna hear, <laughs> which made it very fun, but also a little unsettling, because you need to know what your students are saying. <laughs> so, so in this context where there's so many different perspectives and so many different traditions and so many different religions, I needed to come to them and say, hey, there is a truth. But when I was teaching in that setting, I wasn't allowed to name it as Christ. So I had to name it as truth. And I had to just work from that. And I had to believe that the tapestry of Christianity, the stories that we've been given, are big enough and robust enough that if my students looked at their tradition and found pieces of it in our tapestry, it would be something that they could hold on to and they might not fall into the chaos on the other side of the tapestry. So I realize I'm making a lot of bold claims about stories. So I'm hoping to justify those. In my experience, I found that there were three primary stories, three primary types of stories that I found particularly useful in this context, and that was myths, fairy tales, and poetry. And I think that all else, all other seven liberal arts, are built upon those, and all other stories. I would even argue that you shouldn't teach a novel until you've mastered these three. I think they're the absolute foundation, even with high schoolers. I believe these three are the foundation. And hopefully, even if I don't convince you of that, maybe you'll leave not thinking it's such a bizarre statement. We'll see. All right, so why myths? I don't want to go into this too, too much because this is such a part of pop culture now, is Jungian archetypes and mythology. Um, but I do want to point out that 
that myths reveal the patterns of the universe. So as I was mentioning, I had students from all these different traditions. So one of the things that I did very early on, is this yes, very early on, was to have them go home and ask their parents and their grandparents and their aunts and their uncles, the elders in their community, to tell them their heritage, their traditions, the oldest ones that they could possibly think of. What were the oldest myths that they could come up with? And then I had my students come into the classroom, and we made a fake fire, and we set up fake stars on the ceiling, and we did our own campfire time where the children were able to share their traditions with the group, which gave everyone a, a, a common sense of our shared humanity and a respect for each other's traditions. And most importantly, I think, what we did was we noticed the things that were similar in all of the different traditions that the students brought to the room. So we see in myths a lot of the same patterns over and over and over again, and I think that's because the tapestry of Christianity is big enough to contain with, within it the essential components of reality. And because they are true, because they are the essential components of reality, they appear in many different myths. Because originally myths were told in a community to teach the members of the community what it meant to be human, what it meant to be a human in that community, and how to pass on your shared values to the next generation. That's what myths were for. So they were the key element of all children's education. So we see a lot of similarities. The first thing we did with, with my students was look at creation myths that were creation ex nihilo. And we found that, especially around the Mediterranean, so many of my Middle Eastern students in particular, had creation myths that were creation ex nihilo. And there's this common concept of chaos, there's disorder, then God speaks, and then there is light, and then light brings forth new life. This happens over and over and over again, which reveals to the students that chaos is a part of human experience, but that God can step in and he does, this is the pattern, he steps in and he brings forth order. Time and time again, it's order composed out of chaos. We saw this in all of their traditions. We also saw the father as the tradition bearer and the son who archetypally would go out, would challenge the father, would reject the parts of tradition that he considered to be dead, but would always bring new life to the tradition. And there was always this dynamic relationship between the tradition and the son who would go out. We saw this in many of the myths. Again, we saw order and chaos. We saw masculine and feminine. And we saw the dissension into the underworld and ascension, the rise again, rising again. <coughs> in all of the different myths, and, and again, this is kind of pop culture now. You can look up like Jungian archetypes and you'll find all of these things. Um, but these are the stories, I think these are stories that all traditions have told because they're fundamentally true. And if we can align ourselves with reality, then again, we can have a robust conception of reality that's able to withstand the chaos that we will face in life. There's also archetypal characters, as well as archetypal structures. So we found the trickster, and this was really fun, looking at all of the different types of characters, because as we were able to recognize characters, the students could see themselves in the stories, and they could also see, well, on one hand, that they weren't as clever maybe as they thought they were, which is good for a student to learn, but also that they're deeply human, and that's essential for our students to learn. So we saw the trickster, like the spider from East, from West Africa, Nancy, who's not only weaving lies and tricking people, but he's also helping people. And most importantly, he's weaving stories, which is just like Odysseus, the teller of tales, the teller of lies. What do we do with these people? They're, they're essential components of culture. Because not only do they challenge the status quo, but they make new stories with that creativity, with that power and that ability to question. We saw Mother Earth in various forms giving birth to life and learn to respect her. We saw many different heroes. 
like Heracles, Achilles, Theseus. Heracles, I think, is particularly interesting, especially in Africa, because Heracles was from a very early period in Greek mythology, and he carries a club to show that he was before the time of sophisticated weaponry. And his, his story begins with he's married, he has children, he's very angered, he kills his wife and children. And in order to purge himself from these sins that he's committed, his father-in-law tells him that he has to go out and complete all of these tasks. The, the, the most important task that he has to do is defeat himself, defeat the wild man within him. And that's why when he kills the lion, he puts the lion, the lion, um, not clothes, the lion skin on him. And he wears it as an emblem, partly to say, I am the wild, but more importantly, to say, I've defeated the wild. So he's defeated the wild within him. And I think with, with the heroes, and this is, this is my own theory, so take it or leave it. Um, the Greek heroes are particularly potent for students. They're particularly valuable because the heroes in many other traditions are more godlike. They have more god, they're, they're usually gods. But in the Greek tradition, there's many heroes that are humans. And this is a hint at what we only see fully reconciled in Christ, where we have fully God and fully man. We see a yearning for the fully God, fully man hero before that in the traditions that stem before. And it's only in Christ that we see the full fruition of that archetype. And most importantly, I think, in terms of students understanding reality from stories, is chaos and the way it's presented. So chaos and myth is always presented as a combination, as one creature that's a combination of different creatures. Because this is what chaos disorder is. It's the, dis, the, the inappropriate combination of things that scares humans the most, that is most threatening to humans that they have to face. When things are ordered and structured and in their right place, the, the story is harmonious. When things are disordered, when things are not fulfilling their nature, when their nature is combined in a way that is not appropriate with another nature, it becomes the monster. This is why every monster in mythology is a combination of different types of creatures. I particularly like the Groot slaying from South Africa. It's, an, it's a giant elephant that's also a snake, and it lures elephants into its cave. So we see again that this is what humans fear, is the breakdown of nature. This is a quote from C.S. Lewis. He says, the value of myth is that it takes all the things you know and restores to them the rich significance which has been hidden by the veil of familiarity. So the patterns, it's like a fish in water, right? The fish doesn't know that it's in water. We can live in these universal, these true structures and patterns and, so, and live within them so completely or so badly that we don't notice them anymore. But myths draw our attention to that which we've grown bored with because of familiarity. They say, hey, here's this thing. You love it, you, you do. You just don't know you do. So let's show it to you in another form to make it feel just a little bit unfamiliar so that you can remember how much you love this truth, whatever the truth is that that myth is expressing. Okay, after I did myths with the um, international students, and by the way, they loved doing the myths. It really brought them to life and taught them to respect each other's traditions. And that was so important to me and gave them a fuller sense of what it meant to be human. The other thing that I did when I started teaching, when I started homeschooling Ugandan students, I knew I was gonna have a hurdle only because the Ugandan schools that they had been going to were so intent on giving them a job, even though there were no jobs available, really, in Uganda. There were some, but very few. Um, that everything was about rote memorization. Everything was about just having the right answer. There was no creativity. 
in, in the schools that they had been attending. I'm not saying all schools, but the ones they had been attending. Um, and so they weren't allowed to even paraphrase. They weren't allowed to say something in their own words. So I would ask them, you know, what something meant, and all they'd have is the dictionary definition, which was great. They'd have it memorized perfectly. But then when I said, well, what does that mean? They had no idea. And I mean, this was their education. This was, this was their experience. So I knew right off the bat I had to change the way they think. I had to find a way to show them that their thoughts were valuable, that they needed to process things, internalize them, and then externalize them through their own brains and their own means, whatever that looks like, for an idea to stem through their own, or to, to breathe its way through their own soul, and then find a new expression. So I started with fairy tales, and they were in high school, and we did two weeks, I think it was, it might not have been that long, of nothing but fairy tales. And even then, we did six months of still fairy tale like stories before we moved on. But from there we moved on to Homer and it was great. They had the they had the foundation that they needed for Homer. But I don't think they would have been able to read Homer if we hadn't first mastered the fairy tale. And this is why. So fairy tales this is so great. <laughs> this is so great. Fairy tales are the manifestation of the incarnation. So Dorothy Sayers talks about this. She says that in history, we see Christ in the incarnation takes all of these bees. So she says that in history, in myth, in story, in tradition, there's all these beautiful beads of truth that are scattered around the world. And all these different cultures have different beads. And when Christ became incarnate, he strung together all of those beads and then made a pattern out of them. And because of that, he took myth and pegged it down into history. And myth and history were no longer incompatible. And after that, fairy tales altered. Now, fairy tales we think probably existed for, there's evidence, 9,000 years. They're very, very, very old. Also, they weren't intended for children until the last about 200 years, which is basically a product of French Romanticism. So when I say fairy tales, I'm not really talking about, I'm definitely not talking about Disney, but I'm not really talking about maybe what you think of. Um, I think the best fairy tales are Celtic, Germanic, Russian. Um, those tend to be the ones least influenced by Romanticism. And in terms of story, this is kind of a side note and I'll go on, but in terms of story, the, the real problem with Romanticism was the emphasis on the individual. But in fairy tales, we don't see that. We see emphasis on universal truths and archetypes. So we see archetypal structures and archetypal characters and motifs, the same as we did with myth. The first being curse, the curse, right? So in so many fairy tales, we see that there is a curse. This is because fairy tales were meant to express reality. And what is the deepest truth, the deepest reality to human experience? We are living post-fall. That's where it begins. So our fairy tales take place within a cursed world. From there, we often see there's some form of sleep and awakening. So sometimes it's the kind of curse, the kind of sleep that's just one character, but typically it's one character makes a foolish decision. It's just kind of misguided. And then the whole kingdom from the plants to the animals to the mice to the king is held according, is held by this curse. And often they all fall asleep. And then something has to come and awaken them. Now sometimes this is, this is seen as the princess and the prince, and there's sort of a condemnation that the princess is the one who falls asleep. But I think there's a very legitimate reason for that. Um, we sleep where we're safest, and the princess is perceived in fairy tales as the embodiment of culture and tradition. So she stems from the father who's tradition. She is the, the product of that tradition. And then she stays in the home to nurture it. She is that which gives forth new life and nurtures life. So she is culture, she is society. So when the princess falls asleep, it's not the individual princess. 
This is what I was saying, that romanticism makes it all about the individual. Fairy tales are. It's not, hey, here's this individual human who was so weak and pathetic she fell asleep. No, it's the princess represents culture. She has lied dormant. There's something deeply wrong with this kingdom. It is under a curse. And all that ought to give forth life and nourish that culture has fallen asleep. So who can wake that up? Well, it would have to be the son, right? Remember earlier I talked about in myth how the son challenges the father? In fairy tales, his act of challenging the father is to go out to take what he has learned from his culture, step out into the chaos that lies outside the kingdom. There he faces a dragon again. A dragon is a combination of creatures. He, he faces disordered nature. He faces chaos and then defeats it, and then comes back, or maybe he doesn't defeat it, maybe he faces it in saving the princess. It could be either way. But then, because he is the part of the culture and the community that has challenged it and moved outside and is bold enough to face the chaos that's outside of the tradition that they have been granted, he's the one that can come back. So he's the one that is awake and, come back and, and can come back and wake up culture and society. So fairy tales go far beyond, here's a princess and here's a prince. That's not at all what they're saying. We see a kingdom, why do we see a kingdom? Because hopefully our children can grow up believing that we are intended for a kingdom. That the kingdom of heaven is at hand, that the kingdom of heaven is within them. There's always this idea in a fairy tale, even if the characters don't go into the kingdom, there's always an idea that the kingdom is there. And that their life is defined by their relationship to the kingdom. So sometimes that means they have to move towards the kingdom or redeem the kingdom. Or sometimes it means they've come from the kingdom and they're in the land of the other and they have to remember the kingdom. That's another motif that we see frequently in fairy tales is that they travel out into the other land like Sir Gowan and the Green Knight, right? He's out in the other world and if he's not able to remember himself and the tradition that he's been given, he will lose himself in this other place. And so I mentioned the dragon, right? Again, this image of chaos. It's particularly a dragon in fairy tales because of the serpent in the garden. So it's carrying on that imagery for our children. And then what is essential, and this is why I cannot bear Disney versions, is the willing sacrifice. In fairy tales, almost across the board, especially the Russian fairy tales, the sacrifice has to be willing. So, uh, what is it, um, Beauty and the Beast. Beauty has to willingly go, and the Beast says, I only want her if she's willing to come. I don't want her if, it's, if I'm forcing her. Compare that to the version that we know, right? Um, so there has to be this willing sacrifice. Why? Well, Christ, right? We want our children to believe that the willing sacrifice is the way of life, and Christ sets that example for them. So hopefully you're seeing that these stories reveal true reality to the children through patterns. It's these images, these archetypes, these patterns that we can give our children. And even though it might not be true, I would say, as Lewis has said, it's truer than true. It's more real than what we think of as real. It's more real than facts, whatever facts are. We also see archetypal characters and motifs. So again, I talked about the princess and the prince as representing culture and as representing that part of culture that can wake up and come back and save that which is like dormant. Um, numbers. So one of the seven liberal arts is basically numerology, arithmetic. We think that's math, like adding numbers, it's not. It's numerology, it's knowing what numbers actually are. Fairy tales is the first way to learn that. So every fairy tale typically starts with, once upon a time, or in a certain kingdom, or in a land far away, whatever it is, there was one king with nine children and six daughters, and the third youngest of the six daughters had four apples, and on the third apple there was four worms. It's all these numbers over and over again. That's not a real fairy tale. Mm -hmm. There's all these numbers over and over again, and as students hear fairy tales, the more you hear them, the more you start to know, oh, hey, it's the third child. This child is going to face something. This child is going to make a willing sacrifice. This child is going to go out. This child is going to bear the burden of society. They know that the moment they hear three. They can't articulate it, but they have a poetic knowledge that they gained through experiencing patterns. 
So they start to learn what numbers represent, and they know what 12 and 9 and 6 and 7 means, so that later when they're mature and ready and read the book of Revelation, all of those numbers have been encoded in their conception of story. And they don't have to go look up what does 12 mean or what does 6 mean. They've been fed these numbers from a very early childhood. And the fairy tales are intentionally using scripture as, as, their, um, as their language. Um, there's also, I mentioned the youngest child, and the rose, the rose is that which most frequently represents Mary, represents innocence, um, but it's also that which you have to fight for, that, that which has been cursed. It's the beauty that has been brought into the curse, right? The thorns so often in fairy tales, if you have to fight through briars and struggles, that's defeating the curse. But within that, within the struggle to conquer the curse lies beauty. So that's why we see the rose with its thorns. Also, I didn't mention this, with sleeping and awakening, one of the reasons that this is a common motif in fairy tales, again, this is my own theory, so take it or leave it, is that the early Christians, every single morning, would read, and by the early Christians, I mean like, this was a very long time, like 1,500 years, would read Psalm 3, which I wish that I could remember exactly. It's the one that's like, I, I like, lay down and sleep and you woke me, oh Lord. Something about falling asleep and then the Lord comes and rescues you. And in the rule of St. Benedict, it's prayed every morning as well. So it's, a, it's deeply ingrained within the human, within the Christian psyche, to think about sleep as that time in which you cannot pray, that time in which you are not conscious, you cannot save yourself, and something from the outside has to come and step in. So I think that's why that's a common image, is that we see that first in the Psalms. Okay, I had to bring in Tolkien. I'm sure you guys were all expecting it. If you haven't read it, do read Tolkien on fairy stories. Um, Tolkien might be my favorite author of all time, which I'm a little embarrassed to admit because it should be Homer or Shakespeare, right? But I love Tolkien. Um, so I know this is a long quote, but I hope that you'll bear with me and allow me to read it to you. He says, the consolation of fairy stories the joy of the happy ending, or more correctly, of the good catastrophe. The sudden joy is turned, for there is no true end to any fairy tale. This joy, which is one of the things which fairy stories can produce supremely well, is not essentially escapist nor fugitive. In its fairy tale or other world setting, it is a sudden and miraculous grace, never to be counted on to recur. It does not deny the existence of this catastrophe, of sorrow and failure. The possibilities of these is necessary to the joy of deliverance. It denies in the face of much evidence, if you will, universal final defeat, and in so far is evangelium, giving a fleeting glimpse of joy, joy beyond the walls of the world, poignant as grief. Few things in life are as strong, as potent, as poignant as grief. And for a scholar to say, fairy tales can give us a joy as poignant as grief. This is, a, this is something that I think we have to listen to. And why? What is it about fairy tales? It's the joy, it's the kingdom, right? He says they never truly come to an end, of course, because if they're truly speaking of the kingdom of heaven, they can't. And we can give our, our students and our children a desire for the kingdom of heaven by giving them beautiful images of the kingdom that never fully ends. And of course, the church has to be the first place of this, but that doesn't mean that we can't have iterations of the liturgy in our homes, right? The liturgy is an expression of patterns in practical human experience, and I believe that stories are another imitation of that, another iteration that we can experience in our homes together with our children. Okay, the third type of story that I found most valuable, and I did not take my clock with me, so I have no clue if I'm going way over. So if you guys want me to stop, just tell me. Because otherwise I'll talk all night. <laughs> um, poetry is where it really came home for me. <laughs> Quite literally. 
didn't mean that literally, but I guess it is. Um, poetry, I began teaching to my high schoolers because I wanted them to see that language was fun and engaging and beautiful. I wanted them to hear the rhythms of English because again, they were ESL. And what better way to hear the rhythms of English, which is iambic pentameter always anyway, than poetry. And so I focused on poetry with my students and every day, multiple times a day, with my foster ch child. So I mentioned that she came to me not knowing English. So like any rational person, I sat down and read the sonnets of Shakespeare to her every day. <laughs> she had no idea what I was saying. And I didn't care. She was hearing the sounds of English. We also did nonsense poetry every day. The most nonsensical things you could think of, the more nonsensical the better. And it was showing her that language was a tool for her. And it, it didn't matter because all English was nonsense to her anyway. She'd come speak, speaking Uganda. So I was like, let's, let's find something where we can have common ground. I don't know the language, you don't know the language, but we know poetically what's being expressed. Right, this is the experience that we have with Jabberwocky from Lewis Carroll. Who's ever read Jabberwocky and not known what it's about? Have you read it and thought, hey, I know what this is about? Raise your hand if you've read it at all. Okay, raise your hand if you read it and said to yourself, I have no idea what that was about, no clue whatsoever. Okay, a few people. You didn't know there was a boy fighting a monster? Even that basic level? No? Okay. Well, I want to read the first, I shouldn't have told you what it was, we could have guessed. Uh -huh. um, I'm going to read this to you because it became her favorite. This and The Owl and the Pussycat were her favorite poems. And she would recite them standing in line at the bank or riding a bus. Wherever we were going, she would just, just say them, just over and over in her head like a song. So Jabberwocky by Lewis Carroll, this is only the first three stanzas, I didn't put the whole thing. Um, Twas brillig and the slidey toes did gyre and gimble in the waves. All mimsy were the moro boro groves and the momrants outgrave. Beware the Jabberwock, my son, the jaws that bite, the claws that catch. Beware the jub, -jub bird and shun the friminous bandersnatch. He took his vorpal sword in hand, long time the maxim foe he sought. So rested he by the tum tum tree and stood a while in thought. Oh, did I stop there? Mm -hmm. And as an ifish thought he stood, that would be the next stanza. Um, so here we have the expression of an idea that we can understand on some level. We can't literally understand it, but there is some idea that's expressed that we can receive. And what I think is most important about poetry and why it was important to me to teach formal poetry is coming back to this idea of the tapestry, that the universe is ultimately ordered, right? This is the proclamation of Christianity. And this is what makes us, especially compared to the modern world, so unique, is that we believe there is an order to the cosmos. So what better way to teach our students that there is structured order than structured word, right? If we can give them structured poetry, it, it, it melds, it welds form with content. So up until this point, I've been talking about content, right? The content of myths as revealing truth and reality, the content of fairy tales as revealing the incarnation and truth and reality. But what if the form revealed truth and reality and structure and order? So that's why every single day we consumed poetry. And my students would come in and just recite poetry for fun. And it became our common human experience. And I reached the point where my foster daughter would start saying things in the meter of the poems that she'd memorized. So if she was just talking, she'd act her own words, do whatever, say whatever. She'd use Luganda, she'd use English. Sometimes she'd throw in a little French that she was learning at school. But she would do it, she would say it to the metering of Jabberwocky, or more frequently, the owl and the pussycat. Sometimes um, 
the, the ABC, if you have to teach ABCs to young children, Lewis Carroll has um, the nonsense alphabet. Sometimes she reads those, they're great. So, so in, in nonsense poetry, we're able to see form and structure in, in a less didactic mode. The, the content isn't as intentional, perhaps, as, as myth and as fairy tales. But it's important to give our students the form and the structure before they can move past that. Maybe you guys expected this one to come along as well. I can't quote Lewis and Tolkien without Chesterton. Mm -hmm. So Chesterton said in his book, Orthodoxy, poetry is sane because it floats easily in an infinite sea. Reason seeks to cross the infinite sea and so make it finite. The result is mental exhaustion. To accept everything is an exercise. To understand everything, a strain. So even though poetry seems the most insane thing we could do, especially nonsense poetry, in it lies sanity for our students. In it lies structure. This is another quote by Chesterton. He says, people want, people, people, oh, here we go. People wonder why the novel is in a popular form of literature. People wonder why it's read right. So when you listen to some of these kind of New York cafe uh, freeform 
Would you consider that, would you still consider that poetry, despite the fact that it lacks form? Um, would I consider it poetry? Yes. Would I consider it poetry that helps our students? No. Um, I think that, for, well, that form of poetry is a product of Hegelian philosophy, the idea that any art needs to be an expression of the spirit and that human beings, as long as they're expressing themselves, they're creating a valid work of art and the measure of an art is based upon the extent to which the individual has expressed something. That's Hegel. Um, and so because of that influence, that's, that's where we are now, is that everything is this individual expression. But my argument is that students need, before they express the individual, this is my problem with the novel, this is why I think fairy tales from before the French transition into American language, so you know, think pre-18th century fairy tales, um, this is why those are the most valuable, is because they're retaining this concept of universal truths, of archetypes and patterns, and not simply, here I am, this individual, yay, look at me, because a star that's meant to be a part of a constellation by itself is just a star. But if, if the constellation is a pattern, then we should first teach our children how to live within that. And then I think there's a place for free film poetry, absolutely, once you've found your place within the pattern. Um, so a lot of times children are exposed to like what our popular culture offers in terms of story. And I'm thinking specifically like Harry Potter, um, the Marvel universe, Avengers and so on, um, Disney stories you mentioned. So to a certain extent, like we can try to shield our children from that, but there are like in the pop culture, is there any, are there any stories in the pop culture out there that you would recommend and you think are kind of safe for our children to imbibe that do teach good lessons? Um, you know, what could you possibly recommend? Um, yeah, I, you, as you can probably imagine, when I was fostering, I was extremely picky about the stories and movies that my daughter was exposed to. Um, so we watched a film called The Song of the Sea quite frequently, over and over again, because I believe it has true archetypes. There's also another book called The Book of, Ke uh, the Book of Kells. No, The Secret of Kells. The Secret of Kells. It's about The Book of Kells. Um, and they're from the same, they're beautifully illustrated, they're, they have true archetypes. Um, but in general, I would just say, if you're looking at stories and trying to assess them to see, hey, is this a good story for my child? First ask the question, does this, does the author, does the director have one particular message they want my child to understand? If they do, it's propaganda, period. And if you, if you read a book to a child and say, hey, what's the moral of the story as if there's only one, you're teaching your child to read as if stories are propaganda. They're a real living organic stories beyond one moral. So things like Frozen, I saw it one time and was absolutely aghast, I was horrified. Um, because you can easily identify the message. First, it takes all the universal archetypes of princess and then washes them aside because it acts like they're trying to be particular and they're never trying to be particular. So they've created a strong man fallacy from the beginning. They've made it into something it's not and then washed it away because of it. And then after they've rejected the universal archetypes, they treat these characters like individual characters, but then act like they're still dealing in archetypes. It, I think it's absolutely, absolutely monstrous. Mm -hmm. um, so anyway, the short way to assess a story is, is there one, message and if there is they've elevated the content over the form remember poetry is beautiful because it's teaching form and we don't want to teach something that's focused so so heavily on content that it tosses form aside um and that's again that's that's propaganda so um i don't really know children's stories i i've read the harry potter series and i know that they it deals in true archetypes so i do like those stories um Obviously, Lewis is spectacular. Mm -hmm. I, can't, I, I haven't seen any of the superhero. I saw Wonder Woman, and again, I was so devastated, I couldn't bear to watch anymore. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, become so familiar with the universal archetypes that you can see them and you can know if they're there for your children. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Great question, take it out. So read the story and then don't tell them the moral. 
ask them what the moral is. Read them the story and then say, what should the fox have done? So let it be alive. Esau's fables are wonderful. But somebody else later, a editor, added the moral in. Right? The, the, the Roman variations certainly never had a moral. That was added in later by publishers. Take it out. Any other questions? Also, I say things rather emphatically, so you can take arms against them. <laughs> I like it when people do. Yeah. Right. If you have the ability to do a summer program to ease them in, do and do it with fairy tales. Um, if you don't have the ability to do that, do a crash course on myths and fairy tales so that they can know what to look for. The problem with students reading is that they don't know what questions to ask. They don't, they don't have any clue how to read because they don't have any clue what to look for and they need to be looking for archetypes. So there's, there we have legends, um, and it's kind of a fun interplay between legends and myth. They do blend. So I think that there's something really valuable in, in those, yes. You just have to be aware that they can be propagandistic, and sometimes they're created for that purpose. Whenever we have legend, there is an agenda behind the legend. Um, but sometimes the legend is so real, so well aligned with reality, that it becomes, it transcends its, transcends its own purpose. Like, I would argue that the Aeneid does that. That Virgil was writing this somewhat as a propaganda for Augustus, but that it transcends that because it's so well aligned with reality. Any other questions? Well, thank you for listening. I appreciate that. Thank you. so much. That was really, really excellent. I know I learned a lot, so thank you so much. Um, again, this is uh, the third of our four-part speaker series called Hearts United, and it is uh, presented by our church and school um, with the help of Belmont Abbey College. So um, we thank everybody for coming out here, and I want to tell you about our last speaker, um, which is May 20th, and so we're going to have Dr. Greg Monroe. He is a superintendent superintendent of all the Catholic schools in the area. So he's going to be coming out and he's going to be talking about the goal of Catholic education, a light in the darkness of moral relativism. So we're going to do it right here like this, wine and cheese, um, same thing as tonight. So bring your friends. So that's going to be our final um, speaker in the four part series. And then um, I just have to say I'm so excited to look around and see people from our school. We have a lot of homeschool moms, we've got teachers, we've got coaches. Um, really exciting to see the community come together. This was the whole purpose behind the speaker series. That's why we called it Hearts United, um, was to really bridge that gap because Catholic education is super, super important and it's a major mission of the church. So to see our homeschool moms and our teachers and our parents and members from the church community out here tonight is very, very encouraging, I know, for our principal, um, Ms. Bowman, and all of our teachers, and just all of us to see, um, and school parents, to see everybody out here together is really an exciting and wonderful thing. So thank you for coming out here tonight. I am really sorry about this, um, Katarina. <laughs> I'm going to next time get a better <laughs> for you. Um, but thanks for dealing with our terrible technology here tonight. Um, and then just lastly, just a really quick plug, and then I'll leave you to finish up our wine and cheese so that I don't have to bring it home. Um, <laughs> the school is putting on some incredible summer camps uh, this summer. So we have partnered with, um, actually we've got a lot of the camp leaders here today. We've got track and field over here. We've got soccer camp over here. Um, intro to Latin, Shakespeare Theater Camp. We're going to be putting on... Um, a Shakespeare play, so, um, and they're going to be doing, uh, like, 
juggling and all kinds of wonderful things. We have a troop coming from out of town to do our Shakespeare camp. Um, we have carpentry camp, a week of the classics. We've got Mr. Stephen Thomas teaching that. Um, choir camp, that's really, Miss Levine does incredible um, choir. So we've got that, reading enrichment. So you can check out our website for all of our summer camps and we hope you guys can join us for some of those. We might be needing to add a fairy tale camp now. I think, I don't know. Um, so we might have more camps to add, I don't really know. But thank you again. Thank you, thank you, Deacon, for filling up her father. We apologize for not being able to be here tonight. He hasn't been come up last second. But uh, thank you for filling in for the prayer. And uh, Deacon, are you going to close us in prayer? And then we can please stay and finish up our wine and cheese and, you know, talk to Katarina and each other. And we'll close out our night. Is that okay? Thank you for, I'm putting him on the spot here for praying, but he does a great job. And take, oh, oh, one more thing. I'm so sorry. One more thing. We thought it would be appropriate tonight, talking about the power of story, to kick off our book drive. So everybody take one of these homes. Um, as you know, switching over to classical education, we are trying to build up our library of classics. And so this is um, an impartial list, but this is a list of the books we need. So we're going to have a bookshelf set up at the narthex of the school. We're also going to have a wish list on Amazon, and we'll send out that link to people through the parish and the school. Um, that you could buy things directly on Amazon used. They have a lot of used books on Amazon too, so we're not above gently used books. Um, so take this list home. Um, we're going to be collecting these classics from now all the way through to the end of the school year. Okay, so bring this home, bring us some books, look on your bookshelf if you have a duplicate um, of a classical book, please um, go ahead and bring it in. So Deacon, now you can take it away. It's all yours, John.